Ich habe Grenzenlosigkeit erfahren. I have experienced boundlessness. Buddha ist Allah. Buddha, Allah and Yahweh are one and the same for me. The most beautiful word for Yahweh is love. You can't personify that. And that's what I really felt and experienced. Sie hatten vor einigen Jahrzehnten im Jahr 1986 Mr. Bartz, you had a near-death experience in 1986. You are also involved in a self-help group. So you have certainly reported on your experience very often now. Nevertheless, I would like to start by asking you to tell us what exactly happened back then. Ja, äh, wir sind in Urlaub gefahren. We wanted to go on holiday. At the time, I already had a high fever, about 40 degrees. I suspected I had flu and wanted to recover on holiday. We went to Italy, but the fever didn't go down. We went to see a doctor who confirmed that it was flu. After three days it was very bad because the human body cannot stand this high fever for long. My wife wanted to go back home. The moment I sat down in the car, I felt my lifeblood running out. My hands and feet turned cold and white. I felt I was going to pass out, but I was desperate to get out of Italy because of the language. We made it just in time. Near a petrol station, I said to my wife, go to the petrol station, get the ambulance. She then went inside the petrol station. That's when I felt I couldn't breathe. I wanted to say something to our son, who was also there. Probably only a croak came out. I wanted to open the car door, but I must have fallen out. And that put me in a situation that changed my whole life. I know from subsequent reports that my son jumped out of the car and screamed, My daddy is dying! My daddy is dying! I must have fallen head first out of the car. A diving instructor who happened to be there and had the relevant skills resuscitated me and tried to save me. But by then I was already in another world as I see it today. The moment I knew I was going to die, and that was completely clear to me, I thought, Jesus, here I am. I wanted to face the judgment, as it is called in the Christian tradition, the judgment of God. This thought is still burned into my mind as a Bavarian to this day. But it didn't turn out that way. This thought, here I am, can you say this was a willingness to succumb completely to the situation? Yes, I was ready to give myself up, to let go. But all of this unconsciously. Actually, as a master craftsman, I was a doer and an authority. But the moment I breathed my last and had that thought, a curtain went up, like I knew from presentations at master school, that suddenly the spotlight comes on and it dazzles. 
but it was like when the sun comes up and it didn't dazzle. At the same moment as this inexplicable security, I felt a vastness and a knowledge that I describe as omniscient. Did the security you expected contradict your expectations of a judgment of God? Totally contradicted. I had no sense of time either. I didn't know how much time had passed. Everything was in the here and now. But this expansion was also a bit frightening because I could feel in my fingers that I was getting bigger. My sense of space went beyond the Earth, beyond the solar system, beyond the universe. And then it went even further. With my mind, I knew that the universe had an end. I stretched further and said, this can't be. But it was. Then I came back and woke up in the ambulance. I didn't know exactly how I'd got there. Had they brought me here? I was still somewhere in the interstices. But what was interesting was that I knew the diving instructor's first name. I addressed him by name once, and he looked quite puzzled because he hadn't mentioned his name to me at all. He didn't have time. He was busy keeping me alive. I got an injection, and the doctor said to my wife, we can't find anything wrong, but take him to Innsbruck to the clinic. At the clinic, they said, we can't find anything wrong. You can go back home. When we got home, I still had a fever of 40 degrees. But that was not the decisive thing, because my whole head was no longer clear. I had reached the point where I didn't really want to live anymore. Whether that came from this experience I had before, I don't know. Anyway, three days later, my daughter came to me, laughed and said, Dad, what do you look like? You have yellow eyes. Everyone came and looked. We called the family doctor, who came immediately and said, Yes, now it's quite clear. You have severe hepatitis, contagious. No one should come near you. You have to go to hospital immediately. I was still out of the loop, because for me it didn't matter. Because when I was in the hospital, I was a private patient, the senior consultant came and said, Mr. Bartz, this will take a little longer. So I said to him, you know what, I have a company, we are on holiday now, the ship needs a captain, I'm going home tomorrow. Then I went home. I heard that his doctors criticized him a lot for sending me home with this illness. But that was a phenomenon that has accompanied me throughout my life in many variations. Are you talking about the phenomenon that you have always been able to experience, particularly trusting relationships with other people? The next day I came back to the hospital. The senior consultant happened to be on the ward, saw me and said, what are you doing? Before the near-death experience, I would have jumped down his throat because no one should have addressed me like that. But I had become meek and humble. He addressed me like that, and I was afraid he was going to send me home again. And then he said, go to your room. Apparently, the bed was still free. Then he came to me and asked, what else do you want? I didn't understand him right away. What else do you want? Do you want another ship? Do you want another house? 
And I replied, it's none of your business how many houses I have. Today, I know what he meant. The senior consultant then came to me every day and sat on my bed. That alone is unusual. A doctor sits with his patient. He held my hand and looked at me for 15 minutes. Nothing more. He simply looked me in the eye. We became friends. That is such a phenomenon. So, from a purely medical point of view, it was a case of hepatitis that started to show itself on holiday and only really broke through later. Exactly. I was a marathon runner, I was a doer. And I could easily cope with a 40 degree flu, I thought. But there was another energy that I learned to feel, another phenomenon. So, for you, the finer spiritual aspects of being human have become increasingly important. Yes, but I didn't notice that at first. I didn't notice that I had turned round 180 degrees. I was then brutally told by third parties. I was back in the company and on the construction site after a few months and checked everything. When one of the workers, my right hand, messed up once, I said to him, OK, Hans, you fix it now. Then he asked me, boss, do you have a moment? I'd like to talk to you. I replied, sure, but not on the construction site. And he then asked quite anxiously, because of my mild reaction, Boss, are you still interested in the company? I almost fell off my chair. I built up the company. Hans, how can you think such a thing? So it took you a while to become self-aware of the great inner change you went through. He had made a mistake and I patted him on the back and said, you fix that now and that's the end of it. That was completely new for him. Because before, I had always pretty much put people down. I was a figure of respect. Ooh, here comes the boss. That changed from one minute to the next, without my even being aware of it. For you, it was a matter of course. For me, it was not recognizable that I was a different person. I was the same on the outside. Let us stay a little longer with the dimensions of your inner change. You grew up, not uncommon for Bavarians, as a Catholic youth and, due to religious tradition, you certainly had clear ideas about what awaited you in the afterlife. I once read of you, quote, Lord God, here I am. I have been a right swine, I know that. Can you tell me a bit more about what exactly you expected and how these expectations were then not fulfilled? My worldview was turned upside down. You expect to be judged and then you are received. I say this now in my Bavarian mentality, with the sentence, nice that you're here. It was clear to me that I had been weak, had made mistakes and had driven people crazy with my manner from time to time. Not only the staff, but also my family. And now I hear, I like you just the way you are. No one can understand that. Being accepted unconditionally. It's something where the mind stops. I felt that when I started to get into it, to really grasp it, that I was in danger of going crazy. Even after years of the process of realizing I still had severe depression. It was only when I started to understand it with my heart that the aha moment came.
I began to understand what a great gift it is. Until then, I often told people, I experienced something very funny. I saw the radishes from below. The term near-death experience did not yet exist. People would then ask, well, what do you mean? Have you been reanimated or something? And I said, no, I was somewhere between heaven and earth. And then I noticed how people rolled their eyes. When exactly did you experience such reactions? That was right after the near-death experience, and it took a few years. I was publicly known. I was in master school. I was deputy headmaster. I was the head of finance in the Bavarian Guild Association. And then I told stories that no one could understand. And I felt, or they even told me openly, you're stupid. Or they said it behind closed doors. Poor Werner, he's going crazy. I was enraged. I threw tantrums because it was absolutely real for me. I experienced something and I felt how it changed me inside. In 1986, when you had your near death experience, this term was already somewhat known through Raymond Moody. When did you realize that there were other people who had experienced something very similar to you? As a master craftsman, you have only one goal, work. Sometimes I had a lot of employees, usually 15, but sometimes there were 30. And you work 60 hours, day and night, Saturday and Sunday. But there was always this experience. It never let me go. It was a process of three or four years. Of course, I tried to get fit again, to run again, to train. We were a group of five, six people at that time. I took breaks from running every now and then, and the others said, Werner is not quite fit yet. But that wasn't the reason for my breaks. It was nature that appealed to me, for example, a tree. So I'd stop, and they'd wait for me. But I didn't tell them that a wheat field had just captivated me, and that's why I had to stop. Such experiences showed me that I had changed completely. Did you also experience such a connection with things, connection with everything in the near-death experience? No, the connection was not recognizable. I had a connection with space, with emptiness, the topic of the ego. We like to identify ourselves with the social role we play. Werner Barth, the master roofer. How did you perceive yourself in the near-death experience and afterwards? What changes in the ego were there? The ego of Werner is no longer the ego it was. You're not so important. You're like a grain of sand in the desert. But you are also the desert. That was this contradiction. I could then smile mildly and say, you live on this earth and this earth consists of duality. Everything, every last thing has its pros and cons. I am connected with everything. The ego is this little drop that falls into the sea, dissolves, and yet is still there. Today, I know, when I said back then, but I am weak, I am a weak person, that the weakness is the strength. Understanding this makes it possible to smile even in the face of death. 
I pray that I may consciously experience dying. This transition process, yes, that is my greatest wish. Were you already convinced of life after death, before the near-death experience, because of your religious background? Or was that more of a customary belief? I was in the Catholic youth, I was a youth leader. But I had experiences that were contradictory. That is, everyone had to go to church on Sunday, of course, except Werner. I had a special position. My comrades said, hey, why don't you get a telling off? If we don't go to church, the priest will hit us on the head, and he won't say anything to you. The background, which I didn't know myself at the time, was that my father had the opportunity to get films, which was almost impossible at the time. He often lent the parish feature films, which were then shown in the church or in the lower church. I suspect that the priest didn't dare scold me, because then he might not have been able to get any more films. You had a starting advantage as a son. That is duality. And there are people involved everywhere. How did your relationship with the Church develop after your near-death experience, with religion in general? I'm still Roman Catholic, I haven't left. After the near-death experience, I went to the Protestants because I thought that was a reformed church. But there were also many weaknesses. The worst thing was that I immediately realized the limitations of this religion. Then I went to the Buddhists for ten years. Mindfulness. Then I realized that's also the same thing. What I mean is, every great religion, like every state, needs a certain delimitation. That is part of its demands. But I have experienced boundlessness. Buddha, Allah and Yahweh are one and the same for me. The most beautiful word for Yahweh is love. You can't personify that. And that's what I really felt and experienced. How did your change in personality affect you professionally? You were a different boss. Was that good or bad for the company? I'd say in Bavarian, saugut. So brilliant. Originally, I was a tinkerer and always tried to make the world perfect. If someone said, I don't like that little corner or whatever, I'd always try to contradict them and said, why, there's nothing wrong with it. But afterwards, it was completely different. I sensed that the person was looking a bit funny and asked him, is there anything you don't like? Yes, there's a corner up there. Where? The fifth tile on the ridge turret. Then I asked a co-worker, Alphonse, Josef, look up there, Sepp, there's something up there. He might have looked at me in surprise and I said, go up and do something. Later I asked him, is it all right now? Yes, now it fits. That was also a consequence of my change. I wanted the client to say to me, I am happy as can be with your work. And then a very good question was, 
Will you send me the bill soon so I can pay for it? That's the kind of thing you wish for. Well, if that's not a change. How has your change affected your private life, if I may ask something so personal? Privately, it was very painful at the beginning because the family, as the closest environment, could not understand what I had experienced. I told them about it and immediately realized they find me strange. The family was my anchor. I wanted to anchor this experience somewhere, but I couldn't do that in my family. That led to my divorce after about four or five years, despite therapeutic measures. That was the point at which I totally fell into depression. But I experienced this phenomenon again with a simple lifeguard and masseur who showed me a way to God again. I don't like to say the word God anymore, I prefer to say Yahweh. But at that time, it was about the Lord God. I said to the masseur, I have no one left, I am alone, I am helpless, it's over, finished, no friends, I have no one left. Then he said to me, think about it, if that's really the case. And then the answer came to me, yes, do you mean the Lord God? Yes, maybe, why don't you try it? And what do you want me to try? Well, ask, pray. And then I formed this sentence. Lord God, help me. Lord God, here I am. But it took me many tries. It was never right. And when I said, Lord God, here I am, I was about to give up. But then I tried one last time. And finally, I managed to let go again. What does Yahweh mean to you? The word Yahweh is very close to me, because the two most significant translations for me are I am there or I am who I am. Now, when I talk to my Lord God, I don't say Yahweh, I say, you, I'm here, what do you say? Or I say, you, I am who I am, where are you? And then it can happen that I and you, you and I, become one. And then you are smaller than a grain of sand and bigger than the desert. You also involved in a NDE self-help group, Nahtoderfahrung München e.V. in Munich. This is, if I'm correctly informed, the oldest such self-help group in Germany. How did this context come about? After I had begun to understand, to integrate my near-death experience in my heart, after my divorce, I sometimes had this thought at breakfast. You have experienced so much. You have been given so much. You have to give something back. Otherwise, something is wrong. And so I became interested in voluntary work. Of course, that's difficult when you have a company. But something had changed there. People trusted me. It was a different basis. And so, after a thorough training, I went into addiction counselling. And then, after ten years, I said, I have to do more. Against the advice of my father and also of friends, you can't do that. But I wanted something else, namely to get involved in end-of-life care. 
In the training, I told the story with the masseur. There was a lady who said, Werner, I'm in a group that would love it if you could tell us that story. Then I said, yes, but what does this group do? A doctor runs it, and they always meet at the doctor's office. I'll give you the address. Then I went and looked at it, and there was the sign, Dr. Dr. Thomas Angerpointner, pediatric surgeon. I thought, that can't be it, a surgeon? But I went in, very, very critically disposed. Dr. Angerpointner welcomed me. I said, I just want to listen. The lady who had arranged the contact was also there. So I sat down, he introduced me, and I said, I want to tell you right up front, I'm not telling you about my own near-death experience, as a result of experience. But it didn't take long before the trust was there, and I said to Dr. Angerpointner, now I'd like to tell my story too. That was the beginning, and it became clear to me. Only near-death experiencers understand near-death experiencers. This group has become a second home for me. I attended regularly almost from the beginning. I think I joined the group at the second meeting. It was a longing to go there and exchange ideas with people who say, that's exactly how it was. While others only know such experiences from hearsay and shake their heads. So you have witnessed the development of this self-help group from the very beginning, so to speak. Yes, exactly. And that was home, so to speak. Dr. Angerpointner later fell seriously ill. He could no longer speak well, and then I took over as moderator. But he realized himself that it was no longer possible. He could no longer walk well either. He then said to me at a private meeting, Werner, do you want to take over the group? I said, no, that's out of the question. I'm not a doctor and we need an academic here. And then, when I was on leave, I read in an email that Angerpointner had said, quote, spoken to Werner, Werner is taking over the group. He has the necessary modesty. He acted as a medic. And I immediately wrote back, how dare you, I'm not taking over the group. I then found out from my wife that Mrs. Angerpointner had visited her before I went on holiday and asked her to speak to me. The letter was not supposed to go out to the others beforehand. When I got home, we sat down together. Then I went to the next group meeting. Dr. Angerpointner was not there, and I said, you read it in the letter, I am supposed to take over our group, but I don't feel suitable. Who wants to take over the group? There is a very specific head position that you take when you stand up there and look into the audience, and everyone is looking at the floor. I understood. No one felt confident about the task. And I finally said, the doer came through in me, fine, I'll do it, but you have to help me. Who will help me? Ten hands spontaneously went up. That was the beginning when I took over the group about eight years ago. But I brought in my own way of doing things and said, we're leaving this model, we're nothing special, we don't meet here in secret, we open up. Albeit, I was also confronted by lots of reservations. So you wanted to open up the group to interested non-near-death experiences? For interested non-near-death experienced people. And how does that work? That was obvious. The Internet. Today, people call me every week, very shyly. You notice that immediately. 
Then it becomes a longer conversation and they say, how can I tell you, I would like to join the group. Then I say, anytime. I say, you can come, you sit in and listen. And then, if you see that it suits you, then you can come again. We now have a wide range of people. People who are simply interested can also come. We're a registered association. We've been granted non-profit status. And the best present was when Professor Brüntrup from the School of Philosophy came to us. He had been with us in the group before I got to know him in Freckenhorst. He said, come over to see me sometime at the university. I'd like to show you the university. I thought, what is this? He told me about a seminar, about a congress that was planned and for which he needed my help. I asked how he envisioned it. He said, we're supposed to convey real-life experiences. Through this contact, our group had experienced a gain in quality. Because near-death experiences, each of us has experienced this, are a borderline experience in life on a knife edge, because one cannot understand what changes a person here, and yet we, as near-death experiencers, want to pass this on. This is only possible if I don't raise my finger and say, I have experienced something great. But if I say, look, I have experienced love, and that's where Jesus comes into play for me. After all, there are many proverbs that say, love your neighbor as yourself. This is something that near-death experiences ought to actualize. Through your work in the self-help group, but also through your personal experiences, You've been able to observe attentively over the decades how society, medicine and science in general deals with the reports of near-death experiences. What has changed? What developments do you see? These changes are also a gift, a phenomenon. When I think back to my time, such things couldn't be told. When I tell people in our group, when you go to the doctor, tell him you had a near-death experience, they reply, for God's sake, he'll think I'm crazy. We had people with us who were in psychiatry. They had bad times. And that has changed through our work in the group and in many other groups all over Germany. Of course, the participation of scientists brings a completely different respectability than just meeting normal people or craftsmen. It's about cooperation. Professor Brüntrup said, we are the theoreticians and you are the practitioners, and only together can we achieve something. Indeed, that really happened. I said to doctors when I was in the clinic, and this happens to me from time to time, do you know the term near-death experience? Yes, I know that one. You're meeting one right here. Tell me about it. That was never the case before. I know padres and priests. What do you know about near-death experiences? Have you had one? Yes. Would you tell me about it? Yes. We need more time for that. They're soaking it up. There are already padres or even priests who come out publicly. 
Und das ist äh, für mich das größte, der größte Erfolg. Für mich, the greatest success is that I said, all this work you put into it, and it was sometimes like a business, was worth it. It was definitely worth it. I am convinced that everyone will have such a near-death experience, but only a few will come back to pass it on, to talk about it. Look, this is what I experienced. Take what you want, or just say no. That is the credo of our group. You are now over 80 years old. How do you look ahead to death, serenely, expectantly? For me, death is a transition. For me, death is when I say, I recognize the bridge, or maybe not, and I go to the other side. It is the same stream that flows inside me and that flows outside me. And when I tell it that I am going to the other side, I can only open my arms and surrender. You don't have to be afraid of the change. Fear is something very important and it is hormonally controlled. But the integration and the source will dissolve that fear. If I say, okay, fear, come here, show yourself, come to me, you are mine, what is left? Mr. Bartz, thank you very much for the interview.